All right, so um, I'm going to start today by talking about some compost critters. So uh, this actually, if you've been around long enough, uh, I presented a little bit about this six years ago, but I feel like it's probably time to bring it back again because we've got a lot of new uh, master gardeners and agents. And it's that time of year where there's not a lot of other activity, but uh, you may be prepping your compost for your gardens coming soon. So decaying plant matter is a great place to find invertebrates, uh, and they may be primary consumers of that material, or they are feeding on the microorganisms that are decaying that material. Um, so this is, a, this is a look at what I have in my yard. Actually, the, the, this uh, ring one was our previous one, and I built these new ones. Uh, you can see here, uh, these are actually, uh, I really like these. Um, my wife is actually the one who runs a lot of this stuff and she's obsessed with the composting. Uh, but we mainly uh, built these, I mainly built these to keep out one critter in particular, this thing, our uh, dog Penny, who liked to jump in the other one and eat everything. And so these are really good at what they're doing. They allow all the small organisms to get in, but not the large uh, canines and whatnot. Um, and we did have opossums and things like that getting in there. So uh, what are you gonna find in your compost? What should be there? This is kind of, uh, if you see these things in there, these are typical, these are normal uh, to be seeing around. So true flies, the diptera, this is uh, the most important group of insects and compost, also the most diverse. Now, one thing to note is that adults may drift from the compost and cause a nuisance, uh, especially the vinegar flies that I'll talk about in a minute. So depending on where your compost bin is, you can have nuisance issues with insects flying out from there, especially flies. And this is one of my favorites, Salva palapes, a xylomyid fly. So um, first, one of the most important flies in your compost, and this is one you really wanna see there, are soldier flies, especially black soldier flies, Hermedia lucens. Uh, they are very uh, voracious feeders on compost. They make a lot of nice uh, compost material afterward. Uh, the adults are wasp-like and large, black with these really psychedelic eyes and long antennae. Um, and they're about an inch long or so. They do not feed as adults, uh, but they do all their feeding as these strange looking larvae. Um, and uh, basically, if you have them in your compost bin, that's a good thing. And looking at your compost bin, you may see something like this. This is from my old compost bin, and that's a rind of a squash. Um, and uh, you can see all these uh, black soldier fly larvae in there uh, doing the job to, to reduce the vegetable matter. Now, another soldier fly you may see swarming in huge numbers is the genus Tecticus, especially Tecticus trivitatis. Uh, online on Bug Guide, it's actually called the compost fly, although I didn't really know of a common name before. Um, but they are yellow, have shorter antennae, uh, and these big greenish bronze eyes. Now, the larvae look very similar, just a little bit different color than the black soldier flies, but are going to be doing a very similar type of service. Um, and so if you see these flies uh, swarming around your compost bin, just know that they're good. They're not biting flies. They're not, they're, they're really doing a lot of the, uh, I want to say leg work, but they're, these don't have legs. So they're doing whatever kind of work in that compost bin. Now, with a lot of wet materials, um, you're going to get a lot of vinegar flies. This is what people typically call fruit flies, uh, although as a dipterist, fruit flies are usually reserved for the ones that attack fresh fruit. So not all of the type are gonna look like the ones in your kitchen, the yellow with the red eyes like this one here, but they are very common, especially like I said, when there's a lot of wet materials because they feed on the fungi, the yeasts, and the bacteria. Uh, that are associated with this compost. And you can see here, um, here's a, a paper towel in there that is, has all these flies. These are courting each other right here and they're just uh, flying around. Um, now you may find different genera. So chymomyza here, they dance a little bit with their striped wings. Um, you may have darker ones, like I said, with more uh, dark red eyes. And these are still drosophilids but not like the ones you see in your kitchen necessarily because there's a lot of diversity out there in the wild. Larvae are small maggots. 
And the pupae can be very common. Uh, I actually saw a video online where somebody had their indoor container for compost infested with these because they had a, a huge amount of, of vinegar flies in the compost and all the maggots crawl up to the top and pupate in the lid. And so you'll maybe find these little brown rice looking things all over and those are Drosophila pupae. Now house flies and kin, uh, the musidae, uh, Musca domestica is the house fly. Per se, they are not common uh, in compost, but often exist where livestock manure is present. So if you have, if you're composting uh, manure, or anything like that, that mixed with the dry matter, organic matter, um, anything like that is going, may produce uh, house flies. And because they come from uh, manure and dung sources, they can actually uh, mechanically or bring diseases with them. But typically we actually don't see house flies around homes as often as you would think by their name. Now a close relative you might find are the lesser house flies, the phanyids. Uh, these are called lesser house flies because they're smaller. They're about half the size of a typical house fly, uh, which means they're pretty small much bigger than a Drosophila. Um, but these are present in compost, poultry dung, and dead animals. They can actually be a real issue when people spread uh, poultry uh, manure on fields and they come out and emerge and become a nuisance, but they're perfectly normal in your compost. And although the adults look a lot like a typical housefly, the larvae are, um, if you look at the larva of a housefly, it's this long, smooth kind of maggot. Uh, the larvae of phanyids are these kind of flatter maggots with these lateral projections. And when they're kind of washed off, they look like little feathers. Um, so again, those are perfectly normal. They're going to be in your compost helping uh, decompose things. Now, there are going to be a lot of other small flies associated with compost. Darkwing fungus gnats are very common in compost. They're common in household plant. Uh, pots as well, but you will see these swarming around uh, compost bins. Their larvae are a little white with a black head, um, and the distinguishing characteristic for darkwing fungus gnats is this tuning fork in the wing uh, and the long antennae. Uh, moth and drain flies, of course, drain fly is the name given to uh, when they're typically found in homes because their larvae develop in the muck in the bottom of drains and in pipes. But that muck is very similar to the muck that's in compost bins. So you're going to find lots of these little hairy flies flying around compost bins and their larvae are going to be in there feeding. Uh, one of my favorites are the minute black scavenger flies, Scatopsidae. They're fairly robust little black flies with a kind of short antennae, even though they're multi-segmented. Uh, you can see they're very, they're called minute black scavenger flies because these are sitting on a window screen. That's how tiny they are. Um, and this is of course a mating pair, but you will find these fairly frequently around compost bins as well. Now, other than flies, you're going to find a lot of other critters. So beetles, uh, there aren't a, um, a plethora of beetles that are there, but you'll find a lot of the uh, fungus feeding ones or things like these sap beetles. Uh, I've found when we were looking through the compost bin and overturning it, we still had some pumpkin from Halloween in there. Um, and this beautiful picnic beetle, Gliscrochylus, uh, uh, was in there. And you'll find these other uh, sap beetles around. Um, and again, they're feeding on the fungus and the decay uh, in this situation. If you go out at night or um, even during the day, you may, found, you may find uh, earwigs and cockroaches. Uh, they love to feed on organic matter as well. Um, and uh, they can be important decomposers of that, of that uh, compost in your bin. Commonly, are, commonly found are the European earwigs and the smoky brown cockroaches or palmetto bugs. Millipedes. So millipedes are not insects. They are a myriapod. Um, they are elongate, many legs, two legs per segment. They are slow, uh, non-venomous, non-dangerous, like their cousins they'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but they are very good at eating leaves and decaying plant matter. And you may find them in abundance in these situations. Uh, isopods, so the roly polies, the sow bugs, the pill bugs, uh, these are um, very common in compost as well. They are crustaceans, so they are basically like land shrimp or land crabs, um, but they have many legs. Uh, they do need a good bit of moisture to survive, and so compost bin is perfect for them where they can eat the organic matter 
and uh, have a lot of moisture to be able to breathe. Uh, gastropods, so mollusks like snails and slugs, they are very common in compost bins as well, where they're going to eat the organic matter um, and defecate, you know, nicely digested uh, compost. Okay, and earthworms. So earthworms, there is vermiculture actually specifically using earthworms to decay matter and, uh, and breed worms. But in a natural compost bin that you have uh, near your house, you, if you start turning it, you're gonna see earthworms well above the ground inside the compost. We just saw some when I was turning ours. And uh, basically they're all different types of earthworms. Uh, this one is probably a typical uh, lumbricid but uh, you may find these Asian jumping earthworms. Uh, so these are iridescent when, uh, when you look at them and they actually flail around like crazy if you were to hold them. They also have very smooth, which is called the clitellum, which is this, uh, a little uh, ring on the earthworm that is used for a diagnosis. And they have this smooth one, again, kind of brownish, like pale brown with iridescence. So, that brings us to our first quiz. All right, let's see how I can do this. Do I need, how do I do a poll here? Ah, there we go, up at the top. Okay, so um, I'm going to launch the poll in a second, but about what percentage of North American earthworms are not native? Is it A, 10%, B, 30%, C, 50%, D, 75%, or E, 100%? And you should be seeing the poll now, okay? Uh, hopefully, everyone's seeing the poll. Ooh, I like seeing the, the active, active quant quantifying of the tallying. Okay, let me see. All right, I'll give everybody until the 30 second mark. Can everybody see the time, Janine? Is that how it works? I believe so. Okay. We, the host and co-host, have a different view. Okay. And okay. cannot vote. Okay. That's a shame. Um, all right, we'll give it until 40 seconds. Okay, so we're going to stop there. All right, we've got a, let's end the polling. So we've got a winner C, 50%. That's a, higher than uh, I thought people would uh, guess. Um, but actually the answer is, uh, let's did, see. did you share the results? Oh, sorry, sorry, I gotta share the results. There you go, okay, sharing results. Uh, so 36% of people chose C, and there's actually a nice almost normal distribution with C being the most and A and E being the fewest. Okay, um, so everybody got that, I'm gonna, Stop sharing the results and move on to the next one. All right, so um, let me clear some of that annotation. All right, so the answer is actually B, 30%. So of 183 species in North America, North of Mexico, about 60 of them are non-native. Now, the interesting thing is that's basically for the all of North America, North of Mexico. The interesting thing is if you are Mike or someone up in the Great Lakes or the very northern part of the U.S., apparently no, we have no native earthworms up there. The glaciers killed them all, and we didn't have them for a long time, and then European earthworms came and settled there. So if you are in the northern border of the U.S., you really have no native earthworms. Down here in the south, there are more earthworms that are native, but again, about 30% total in North America are non-native. So it's pretty interesting. And there's a lot of discussions about the ecological uh, um, issues with that and whatnot, but we can talk about that some other time. Okay, lastly, a few other critters. Uh, there are various predators, so centipedes, uh, ground beetles, rove beetles, and predatory mites. If you see mites very commonly in your compost, you may think that they're uh, something bad or something parasitic. They are almost always eating uh, tiny maggots, tiny uh, nematodes, and lots of little soft-bodied organisms. And you also may see, because of those other soft-bodied uh, decomposers, 
uh, some of the hammerhead flatworms, which are predators of things like slugs and, and earthworms and whatnot. Okay, um, I think that's it for this. I'm gonna check the chat box to make sure uh, that we um, have, don't have any questions. Let's see. All right, so are there any questions? Before we move on to the next section and kind of speed it up and get Mike to get some time. Okay, I'm looking at the chat. All right, for time's sake, we're gonna move on. If you have any other questions, you can ask at the end or, or just type them in the chat and I'll make sure. Are flathead native? They are not. So the, the hammerhead flatworms are not native. There are several species that you might find here in North Carolina, uh, but they are pretty well established. We have one that is potentially a new one that we're still getting an ID back on. Uh, so they are kind of an issue, but we do have some native uh, um, planaria that don't have the hammerhead, usually black and shiny, um, and a flatworm as well, though. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so the flatworms, are they beneficial? They're really, they're not as beneficial considering they, they kill things that will be decomposing the, the compost. But all the things I've mentioned otherwise, other than the predators, are basically beneficial for your compost. They may be a nuisance, but they are there doing their job uh, decomposing things. Um, how do we sure get more, most of these comp? Yeah, so uh, commercially purchased composter with few vents. Uh, so, oh, and I see the question about eradicating hammerhead worms. That's gonna be impossible, basically. Uh, they are well established here. Uh, now, as far as commercially purchased composters, I have found, I've had a few of them over the years, and honestly, those really tight ones don't seem to do a great job necessarily um, of uh, getting a lot of air into them and being able to kind of turn the compost. I've had the ones that spin that are up off the ground. I've had the ones from the uh, state that you buy. Uh, but the ones I made, I feel like, uh, and those open ones seem to get a lot more airflow, a lot more um, uh, populations of these decomposers. They're a little easier to work with. Um, of course, you got to make them, but uh, but I've I've found them to be a little bit better in the compost. They don't stay as wet; they dry out, and that's actually one of the ways, for instance, to reduce the number of Drosophila and the vinegar flies around is to churn it or put them more brown, and that'll uh, dry it out a little bit more and make it a little bit less hospitable for the Drosophilids. But other organisms will will still be there. Um, Okay, City of Goldsboro sells exceptional quality compost. So yeah, if you don't compost yourself, you can definitely get compost from uh, other places. All right, well, I think I'll move on real quickly just so Mike has enough time and uh, we'll answer some more questions later on. Before we leave the compost, Matt, just uh, share a kind of a mini heartbreak that I had with compost. I didn't realize that I had some brown snakes in there until I started incorporating it. Yeah. yeah, that's, I find them when I'm, uh, when I'm uh, raking or, or blowing leaves in the fall, you find them sitting under there. Um, yeah, so they're in there probably hunting all those soft bodied organisms as well. So you do have predators present um, and it's a, they, it's a nice warm place to, of course, composting materials get warm. Uh, and so it'll help with, uh, with killing some flies for instance, but also encouraging some other things. Okay, um, all right, so let's move on. I'm just gonna talk quickly about another subject, the ground nesting bees. So most bees in North Carolina are actually solitary and do not have colonies. Uh, they are important pollinators, and especially I'm talking about them now because at this time of year when it's cooler out, when they start emerging, they're gonna be one of the few major groups of pollinators out. Uh, there are a variety of species and families and often nest in the ground, um, as you can tell from this. So, next uh, quiz we've got. So, which one of the which of these bees is social, i.e., has a colony? Um, so, I'm going to do. All right. So everybody should be seeing this. Uh, maybe they'll see a, their poll. All right. So, we got A, B, C, and D. C, D.
Okay, and I'll give it to 35 seconds. So please get your answers in the next 10 seconds. Again, so we have time for Mike. Got some, some answers coming in. All righty, I'm gonna end the polling there. All right, so everybody hopefully can see that. So A with 52% uh, was the, was the um, most common response. Um, and then next D. All right, so I'm gonna close this. And uh, let's clear some of that annotation. Again, um, please, if, uh, if you're annotating things, uh, or please don't annotate things when, uh, when we're not kind of signifying to annotate things. Um, it just caused me to have to uh, clear it out. Okay, so the answer is, if I can get back to this, a, that is a honeybee. Uh, but as you can see, the other bees look very similar. But actually, in fact, one of them, D, is not even a bee. That's a fly. And uh, we'll actually be talking about that next time. And you can see how much of a nice mimic it is because some people actually answer D, and it is not a social fly. There are actually no social flies. So um, uh, just kind of signifying that some of these bees, these native uh, um these native solitary bees are very close and actually very close in size to a honeybee and look very similar. But what are these bees doing? These bees are, gra are ground nesting typically, sometimes in mass numbers, sometimes a little bit more sparse. Uh, but these bees prefer dry ground uh, with exposed, that should be exposed soil, and they avoid dense turf. So if you have an area where they're uh, colonizing, uh, that's because there's not as much vegetation uh, if you want to discourage them from colonizing there, you can always uh, improve the, uh, the moisture and the growth of the turf to be more dense. But of course, it's good to have these native pollinators around and they're only going to be present for a few weeks in the spring and then gone. So here's one poking its head out of a tunnel. It's probably a female. Uh, but males often come out first and are swarming around areas that they like. Uh, they cannot sting. They do not have a stinger. All ma no, no male bees or wasps can sting. The females then will start digging the tunnels and are fairly timid. Uh, and they'll go collect nectar and pollen, put that together, and make little cells in a tunnel that's uh, usually vertical, less than a foot down, and make multiple cells, lay eggs, and close those cells up. And actually, both the types of bees that I'll talk about today are um, create this uh, cellophane or plastic. It's actually a true polyester around lining of some of these tunnels. So just a couple of the bees that you might see are the cellophane bees. Uh, as I said, that's why they're called that uh, in the family Colettidae. Uh, and these are the, this is the genus Colettes. You can see they look very similar to a honeybee, but they're going to not have as, uh, they're going to have a black abdomen, not as bold patterning. Um, and of course be uh, nesting uh, individually in burrows. Then you have things like the Andrenidae, the mining bees in the, in the genus Andrena. Uh, these bees are similar looking, a little bit more pale, but there's a lot of variability and some, and, and between these two groups, they're almost indistinguishable and I have a tough time with bees anyway. One of the characters though for this group is that they have these thing called the facial fovea and they're just these rough, hairy patches, two rough, hairy patches on their face. Uh, this one is a lot easier to see than on this one. Now, what you might also see is these bees flying around. These are actually ground nesting bee, bee parasites. So these are called kleptoparasites and called cuckoo bees often. They are less hairy. They don't actually collect their own pollen or nectar. What they do is they fly around these ground nesting bee uh, entrances scuttle in, lay their eggs, and their larvae then take over all the work that the other bees did. So it's one of the facts of nature that if you are doing something good, there's probably a parasite that's gonna come try and take that or do something with you. So um, let's see, so that'll end my ground nesting bee uh, section. Um, I'm gonna turn on the chat real quick and see. Uh, are there any questions about ground nesting bees? Now, one thing I should mention too, uh, people get often frightened by them because there's huge swarms of them. They are very, very, very reluctant to sting. So these bees, although they may be a little scary, are not protecting a colony. They are doing all the work by themselves. They are not going to defend 
uh, against intruders. So when I took those photos before of that bee popping out of the ground, I laid basically in their whole community and never had any of them coming at me. In fact, they just kind of stuck in the tunnels and popped out when I was away. So these bees are very important pollinators. They're only around for a few weeks and they are not aggressive and rarely, if ever, sting. So it's one of those things that if you can explain that to people, they're really beneficial to just keep and let kind of run their course. They'll be gone until next spring uh, once they're done. So are there any questions? They do often um, also nest around uh, kids' playgrounds and places like that. That can be an issue because they, they get worrisome. But again, they're really not aggressive. And if you can convince people to keep them, then uh, that's, that's a really great policy. So um, what makes them important pollinators? What relies on pollination? Well, any of the early spring um, flowering plants uh, that the bees visit, and they do pollinate just like um, honeybees. They're going to carry pollen with them. You can see, well, there's nomada, which is funny, is a parasite, and it's still covered with pollen. Uh, but basically, they go around and pollinate flowers. Uh, so ground nesting bumblebees. So bumblebees are a social bee. They do often nest in the ground. Uh, that's where they most commonly do, especially in old rodent burrows and places like that. Now, ground nesting bumblebees can be a little bit of an issue because they are colonial. And so they will defend their nests. So I have had cases where people disturb a, a bumblebee nest and they will come out and try and sting. Uh, they are not as aggressive as honeybees or yellow jackets and, and wasps, but um, they can defend themselves a little bit. So, um, so that's one thing to note about bumblebees as well as any social wasp. Uh, can you speak about the aggressive stinging ground bees? So there really aren't, the ground nesting, these ground nesting bees that I described are not aggressive at all. There are hornets and yellow jackets that later in the summer and later in the season build up bigger colonies and they are very aggressive. They are protecting their nest. Again, like I said, bumblebees can be aggressive and honeybees, of course, are not ground nesting uh, typically. And so, uh, but we all know about uh, honeybees and their, how, how aggressive they may be. Um, so uh, as far as hitting the ground nesting bees, it would depend on what it is. Again, uh, identifying the actual insect and what type of bee it is, or if it's also a hornet or yellow jacket is, is good to know. Um, they should not be following you. These ground nesting bees should not be following you. They are kind of one track mind trying to do their own solo thing. And so they are really not interested in wasting energy and time to chase anybody. So it's likely that there was some other type of probably social bee um, and so these, these bees will not, should not follow you. They are, again, even though they're in a big colony of, uh, of different individuals, they are all kind of, it's like an apartment complex more than, um, kind of a, a group, a big family. So, okay. Uh, I'm just gonna move on real quickly. So I give Mike some time and, um, we'll get some more questions at the end. All right. So lastly, just some bolos. Uh, so February through early April, of course, lots of insects waking up. Um, boxwood leaf miners. This is uh, when they start swarming the boxwoods. Uh, they uh, this will happen around uh, early April or so. It's hard to say whether this will be pertinent next time when, in April when we uh, when we present then. But here's a female uh, boxwood leaf miner. And real quickly, if I can, um, Janine, if I want to share a video. Do I just come out of stop sharing and then share that video? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, let me see if I can uh, share a video. Um, if you're going to share the sound, you're going to need to check that box. Okay. Yeah. I don't, I don't need to share the sound. Okay. I don't know what's going on here. It's showing, I need to get out of, okay. Um, Make sure it's not minimized. Yes. Uh, hold on. Let me, okay. Uh, let me, It's a nice experiment. Okay, all right. Let's uh, share my media player. Can everybody see this? It's uh, I think it's upside down actually for some reason. But if you can all see all these little tiny uh, fragile flies 
I don't know if it's actually working very well for everyone. Um, yeah, I'm not base. sure I see the flies. Okay, it's a little hard to see. Oh, well, no worries. We'll, uh, we'll just move on. Um, but anyway, I have a video up on our Facebook page of some of the flies swarming at Boxwood. And, uh, and if, uh, if you want to go see that. Okay. Otherwise, let's see. Um, now, you, you may be able to find the Boxwood mites active. And once it starts getting warmer out, you're not going to find them. But you will find their damage they cause the Boxwood, the little scratch marks. Uh, fall cankerworms, it's a question mark. We don't know this year how bad they might be, uh, but these little green inchworms with the two pro legs and then a little tiny uh, stubby pair, uh, these can munch and defoliate trees. Uh, but you also have other spring caterpillars waking up that may have overwintered as caterpillars. And lastly, scale insects and their crawlers. The scales are starting to wake up, even though you can't tell because they're scale insects and they may be producing crawlers. Uh, so with that, um, I'm going to stop sharing and, uh, hopefully Mike will be ready to start. Sorry, Mike, if I took too much time. I, <laughs> no, think, no there's some, I think there might be some questions in the chat about sure. the bees. Okay. So let's see. Um, yes. Yeah, so be on the lookout, Bolo, be on the lookout. Um, what is our Facebook page? It's a uh, plant disease and insect. Link. I think it's a PDIC. I'll check that out and I'll put a uh, link to it in the, uh, in the chat box real quick. And actually I'll try and link to that video. I'll try and find that video while Mike is talking and, and send a direct link to that post. Otherwise, oh, thank you for listening. Um, and Matt, you had, Minda had a question up there. Yes. Also about when to expect the yellow jackets and hornets. Uh, ah, so let's see. Um, so basically what happens is you'll have a, a queen hornet or paper wasp or things like that waking up soon, all the insects waking up, they're gonna go out and start a colony on their own and it'll take a little while before there are enough of their workers to build up a population. So typically we don't see the really big issues until midsummer and late summer and fall are when the colonies are at their biggest and most aggressive. And so that's really when we're gonna be uh, looking for those. I'll, I'll try and make sure to put a bolo out uh, when, when the time comes. But, uh, but basically, that's, uh, you won't be seeing any real activity for the next few months um, of yellow jackets, paper wasps, things like that. You'll see a little bit of the paper wasps building their nests, but, but otherwise, you should be safe right now walking around. All right. Oh, uh, is there a way to take out queens? Uh, that is pretty difficult. Um, so especially with uh, ground nesting hornets like uh, yellow jackets. Oh, okay, great. Lucy, um, link to the Facebook page. Let me, uh, I'm going to try and find the direct link to that video and share with everybody later. But for right now, I'll let Mike uh, do some talking. Okay. So again, good morning, everyone. Welcome to year 11 of plants, pests, and pathogens, and hopefully the new Zoom uh, platform that we're using is working out for everyone. Seems to be people are participating, so that's good. If you need to take up and stretch for just a second, uh, do so. And I noticed that Matt was saying he was jealous of Charlotte being in, uh, well, both Costa Rica when he thought she was there, and then New Zealand. Well, maybe this will make you a little bit less jealous, Matt. Let me just share here. Uh, see if this will work now. Hmm. Can't see how to share my my browser. Ah, here it is. So hopefully, what you're seeing here is the forecast from back home, where they're currently at one degree Fahrenheit. 16 inches of snow on the ground and more expected tonight. I'm definitely je jealous of people in Minnesota. And since spring is springing here, I went out and took a look around yesterday, try and find some things for today's program. And I ran across something rather odd, which I do want to share. Let me make sure that I've got this in the right mode here. Oh 
Okay. So are you seeing just one mystery photo? Yes, we are. All right, you're not seeing the answer there, good. And I will try and launch the poll. People are voting. Yes, I'm seeing that people are voting much more quickly than they did on the old Collaborate platform. So hopefully. They're on it. Yeah, this, this is a good thing. And we'll let it run another 10 seconds or so. Just give a little background here. This was out <clears throat> basically behind Kilgore Hall in that little courtyard. This particular one was at the base of a tulip poplar, although they weren't restricted to being at the base of those trees. That may affect some people who chose C. All right, ending polling. And share the results. So um, only one person chose an alien life form. If you are from Earth, sir, then that is incorrect. If not, well then, I guess uh, you are correct. Um, not a pine seedling. I thought at first it might be something like a slug eaten green briar, but some things didn't look right. And I at one point thought too that maybe it was some parasitic plant and I'll show you a little bit later one that came to mind, but it wasn't it. So actually the correct answer here, oh, we only launched an A through D poll, so no one could choose E, so, but it's none of the above. Let's see, we'll stop uh, sharing the results. Apologize for that. Again, bear with us as we... So has this advanced to the answer? Yes, yeah, I see it. Okay. So what this turned out to be, and I got Alexander Krings to confirm this, this is, a whisk fern, Silotum nudum. And just to do a little refresher, those who've been on plants, paths, and pathogens for quite a few years may remember that Dave Stefan and I, one February, did a primer, primer on scientific names and classification. So it's interesting that the genus here, Silotum, means in Greek, bear. And nudum, of course, would be Latin for naked. So the actual meaning of the scientific name of this plant is bare naked. And in fact, it does not have leaves. You may see some little, and I'm not even sure what the structure is called, uh, claw-like processes coming out of these angular stems. But the easy thing to recognize about this plant is the way the stems bifurcate. So it will each uh, main, well, the main stem branches in two, and then each of those in turn branches in two at intervals, so you get this sort of effect. It's also a very stiff, rigid sort of uh, texture, as well as angular on the stem. The main stem on this one had six different sides to it, so that would be different from a green briar, which of course would have thorns but wouldn't have a, an angular stem. When I looked at the distribution for this plant in the plants database, it was interesting because it showed uh, basically the southern, mostly southeastern part of the country. And I know, well, I'm pretty sure that I saw this up on a farm in southeastern South Dakota back in the 70s. So there may be populations elsewhere. If you look in Weekly's Flora of the Southeast, it describes it this way, that that this is found in moist bottomland forests, wet hammocks on soil, stumps, and tree bases, along building foundations where introduced. And as far as North Carolina, it's, uh, there's a disjunct and apparently native population in Northeastern North Carolina, and also rarely naturalized around buildings in Central North Carolina. So I thought this was interesting, and also in case folks did run across it. If anyone brings it in this time of year, they're just starting to get out active in the garden again and finds this strange 
stiff little plant that you will be able to tell them what it is. Which brings up, uh, as long as of course we're talking about scientific names and common names, this question. Which of the following is or are ferns? And this time I'll try and launch the correct poll. Let's see. A through E. All right. So, which of the following is or are ferns? For those who participated before, one change is that this year the polling, and maybe this is why people are more eager to participate, this year we cannot see who's answering what. We just see the aggregated numbers. So I'll give it about five more seconds. Well, basically what the presenters are seeing is the uh, the real time as people, the shared results. So as people are voting, we see the percentages change, but it's, it's the same A, A through E share that you see with the, when, uh, when Mike and Matt share the results. So we were, we were watching these numbers shift and change as the votes came in, but it is, it is anonymous. We are, we're not seeing who voted what. Uh, very good. E was the most popular answer and E is in fact correct. As it turns out, air ferns, and I just learned this yesterday, air ferns aren't even plants. They're the remains of a marine organism that have been dyed green. So that, uh, I remember back in the 70s when those things first came out and supposedly they lived off of humidity in the air and low maintenance house plant and so forth, but turns out it's not even a plant. Asparagus fern, of course, is, uh, is a flowering plant. But Japanese holly fern pictured here, you see the nice crozier developing. Uh, this is taken yesterday just outside our building. And the whisk fern that we saw is a, is a um, I guess you'd call it a fairly primitive one. Interestingly enough though, the, classification here, so at, remember, it, probably learned it as kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. In plants, it's a division instead of phylum. But the class Polypody Polypodiopsida would include both the ferns that we're more accustomed to and this whisk fern. And I even found some pictures online of this being used as an ornamental. Here's one from a nursery in Hawaii. And Mark Wethington had a couple of photos on the J.C. Ralston Arboretum page where he had taken uh, pictures of this plant in botanical gardens, one in Atlanta, I think, and one in New York. If you notice carefully here, there are some small, oops, there are some small spore bearing structures on these stems kind of three lobe things that uh, eventually <coughs> would develop. So no need for pollinators there, it does reproduce by spores. Those who checked it, they thought it might be a parasitic plant and they have been thinking of this, I know I was, in the back of my mind as I looked at it. So beech drops, you can see out in the woods, always under beech trees, of course, because they are parasitic on the roots of those but the branching pattern would be different. These don't have chlorophyll and they do actually have flowers. All right, now some things that we wanna be aware of happening in the garden this time of year. Cold injury is something that I remember first hearing diagnosed in the clinic, um, August maybe of 1998, somewhere in there. And I was so surprised and I asked Tom, Tom Crossell at the time why we were diagnosing cold injury. And it's because the damage occurs at one season of the year, but you don't start seeing the decline in the tree or shrub until it's under stress, hot and uh, possibly dry conditions. 
This is not the same as winter burn, which is a desiccation of foliage. Dry winds and frozen soils can lead to that on our evergreen, both needle bearing and broadleaf evergreens. The classic symptom that you want to look for, as you can see in this gardenia here, is split bark, usually near the base, often on only one side of the stem. This happens when the cold temperatures ha hit before that last part of the plant was able to go dormant for the winter or after it had resumed activity in the spring and was hit by a late freeze. We can see this on a number of different woody plants. Some of the ones to be especially attentive to would be gardenia, as pictured here, pittosporum, boxwood, and fig. Picture I took yesterday, uh, or a pair of pictures out next to Kilgore Hall. And the question I have, is this tree healthy? So, give people a moment to weigh in there. Okay, most folks said true, a few said false, and really it depends on the perspective. If you interpreted the question as, do these grayish blotches all uh, around the one side of the tree represent a problem? If you answered that the tree was healthy because you know that they're lichens and they do not cause a problem for the tree, then true would be the answer. But I look at this tree and I see it's very crowded in its site. Its leaves are a bit on the yellow side. The crown is somewhat thin. So I would not necessarily call this a healthy tree, but certainly it's not the lichens that are doing it. I know though that master gardeners will be getting questions about lichens. And so I'm gonna bring back a little bit on lichens that I did in Plants, Pests and Pathogens back a few years ago. So apologies to those who have already seen this. Mike, um, yes. did you share the results of the poll? Oh, sorry, I forgot. Yeah. To, I could see them and I forgot <laughs> to share them with everybody else. We're going to have to get into that, I think. Yes, thank you for your patience, everybody. Uh, but most people said it was, it was healthy. So lichens are actually a symbiosis between a fungus and an alga. The fungal component is usually an ascomycete, but occasionally a basidiomycete. And the alga is usually a green alga, but sometimes a cyanobacterium or a blue-green alga. You can see a couple of the different pictures here of, uh, of types of lichens that you may see, some folio, some crustos, some fruticos, such as the old man's beard that was submitted a few years ago on this dead branch and a jelly lichen down at the bottom, possibly a colemia species. Lichens reproduce in two different ways. The fungus itself can reproduce sexually by forming fruiting bodies and spores, but the symbiosis itself can form what are called ceridia, little packets that under the microscope you can see contain both the algal, the green cells there, and the fungal hyphae so that those can disperse to new locations and start new colonies. Well, the question though is why do we see lichens on plants that seem to be declining? And I, the best explanation I've heard is if you have a tree or a shrub that's not putting on good diameter growth, then the bark isn't flaking away, the exterior part of the bark isn't flaking away as rapidly as it would in a healthy tree or shrub, and so the lichens tend to build up. Moving along to another situation. Oh, wait, let me actually open that chat. Take. Uh, 
Okay, questions. Typically, how cold is cold in order to injure a shrub? That is going to depend on the plant itself. The uh, pittosporum I gave us an example, for example, is only marginally hardy in central North Carolina where we are. Probably wouldn't want to plant that really west of here, certainly not west of Durham. And other plants, if they do go dormant, can, can manage temperatures well below zero. So the thing to look at would be the hardiness zone, adaptability of the particular tree or shrub you're, you're interested in. And I guess that was the question. If there are no other questions, I will see if I can minimize the chat here. Okay, good. And next topic I wanted to cover quickly, which we have talked about before. I'll launch this poll here. So the pansy and a planter with detritus blight. What is another name for the fungus or the manifestation of the fungus that causes botrytis blight. I'm wondering if we keep it open too long or some people get bored. We don't want to, also don't want to leave it open too long because it'll occur to somebody to start jumping on their phone and doing web searches. So let's take it here and sharing the results. Well, it looked like a close to a tie between C and E. But actually, it is C that is the correct answer here, gray mold and botrytis mite. Uh, black mold, that's used for uh, certain, certain mold or molds that would occur in homes or buildings. Blue mold, well, there's a blue mold disease on tobacco, and there's one unrelated on tulips. Gray mold is the botrytis blight, and white mold would be another disease that we'll mention briefly in, in a moment. Botrytis is going to be, there we go. This is a close up of a rose cane that had Botrytis canker on it. It was incubated in a moist chamber, and you can see all of this growth, the sporulation of it. And the combination of the white canidia or spores and the black thread like hyphae that they are being born on gives you the impression of the color gray from a distance. Here is that picture of the leaf from the pansy that was shown in the slide two slides ago. When I pulled this off the plant yesterday, you could actually see the kind of cloud of spores being released. This is really common in the environment so that you're not going to be able to get rid of it or get away from it. When we have cool temperatures and high moisture, those are going to favor the disease development as is senescent tissue. So you often see a situation like this where a dead blossom serves as the point of initiation of the infection, but when it's touching another blossom or leaf, then the infection can spread from there. So really about all you can do is try and keep your leaf wetness, your flower wetness to a minimum, uh, improving air circulation if that's an issue, not overhead watering and so forth. And our last item before looking at the bolos for the month of March, I wanted to revisit the test that we've talked about a number of times before, how you differentiate between camellia petal blight and just uh, freeze injury or natural senescence of a camellia flower. And when I went and tried this test yesterday, I was, I was surprised that I didn't get the result I expected. So here are two different camellias on campus. And if we take those flowers and remove the base here, can, can people see the cursor, Matt? Or 
Janine, who have your mics on, can you see me indicating I'm not there? seeing the cursor, your cursor. Try moving oh. around a little, a little bit again. No. All right. I'm hmm. going to go to, I'm going to go to annotate then. Mouse. How about now? I still am not seeing anything. I'm not sure. Janine, is there something you may have to do? I'm not seeing the cursor either. All right. Well, I, how about a draw, if I draw? Oh, that didn't work either. Oh. No. Well, we'll have to figure that out for next time. The, the base of the flower when removed, the one from the plant on the left and the one from the plant on the, le the right look pretty similar. The hole that you leave, because remember we're looking for that band of white fungal tissue to indicate whether you had camellia petal blight. Now, in this case, you can tell there's a difference too in just the way that the more dry look on the right and the softer, almost wetter looking decay that goes all the way to the base of the flower uh, in the one on the right. And so I went back out and grabbed another flower from that second shrub and sure enough did see that ring of fungal material developing the hyphae there, the mycelium we call it, in that space once you pulled the base of the flower off. You could see it on the other one, but only if you looked under a microscope. So give yourself, if you're checking for this disease, give yourself a couple of flowers to, to look at and, and verify. Again, the control measures for this would be to remove these blossoms because what will happen is that fungus will continue to develop, form a survival structure called a sclerotium that sits in the soil dormant all summer, all winter, and then timed with the opening of the flowers of Camellia japonica in the spring will release its spores and start the infection cycle over. If you missed your chance of cleaning them out, then you can come in late winter with an inch or so of mulch and covering those up will help reduce the number of spores that are able to get up in the air and reach the blossoms. All right. Uh, I see I missed a question here. Given the incredible rainfall over the past 12 months, should we be expecting much higher mold problems? Uh, Susan, I assume you're talking about in homes or are you talking about in the, the landscape? We do see um, mold problems in homes, but they're associated with leaks. So if you had, let's say, a leaking roof or condensation, uh, water pipe broke, that sort of thing, that's really what's gonna cause your increase in mold problems. Okay. Don't see a follow-up on the question. We had seven inches of rain, more than normal. Yeah, it was, it was very rainy. All right, let me move on then to our bolos here and wrap it up with that. Again, for those who are new, bolo is be on the lookout, things to watch for in the garden and landscape. We don't have too many vegetables out there yet, but if you've got crucifers, uh, collards, cabbage and so forth, you wanna be aware of the possibility of sclerotinia stem rot aka white mold. So you'll notice in the photograph there the rot that's developing and then the whitish fungal growth on the decayed area which will eventually form hard black survival structures again called sclerotia. So this one would be related to the one that causes the petal blight on camellia. Um, I have not seen Botrytis leaf blight on onion but as I was going in updating our BOLO lists for each month of the year, I noticed that uh, we had some previous lists that had that on it. And since it talked about botrytis, I thought I would mention that one as well. Now our flowers and perennials, pansy and viola are gonna be the big things out in the flower beds at this time of year still. Watch for black root rot. 
nutrients running low at the end of the season, and botrytis blight, as we mentioned. Of course, liriope should have already had its winter haircut to get rid of the anthracnose on the tips of the leaves, but you may also start seeing leaves that are dying down from the very bases, and that can be caused by fusarium crown rot, a fungal crown rot. In that case, you have to remove the whole plant. No amount of pruning will save it. A few of the things that could be coming up in turf grasses, fairy ring can occur at any time of year. Our warm season grasses, you can see large patch in the cool weather. And of course, as the Bermuda grass starts to green up in the spring, you may notice areas that don't. And that would be a sign that you have spring dead spot. The infection actually occurred the fall beforehand and then uh, made the grass more susceptible to die out in the cold. On our trees and shrubs, any time of year, we have to be aware that decline could be caused by root rots, Phytophthora and our malaria being the two most common causes. Always be on the lookout for boxwood blight, which we've talked about several times on the program. When trees are bare, we do tend to notice more things like septobacidium or felt fungus. You may see this uh, especially on some of the smooth bark trees like uh, Nyssa, black gum, seems to be a popular one that we get inquiries about that turns out to be septobacidium, which is a fungus that isn't affecting the tree directly, but is colonizing scale insects that are on the bark. Entomosporium leaf spot on red tip photinia and Indian hawthorn, pictured on the left. Black knot, which would be on black cherry or on plum trees. You can see a photo on the right there, lower right of that. Again, noticeable because the leaves are still off of these trees. As things start to warm up, we'll start to see fire blight coming in, especially on pear. And our first rust on eastern red cedar is likely to be quince rust. It comes out a little bit earlier than the, uh, than the cedar apple rust and is not as noteworthy because it doesn't cause the big gall, just the swelling and does have the orange gelatinous telia, but not in the long horns like cedar apple rust does. Cold injury, as we mentioned, frost damage to new growth and a couple of vertebrate type injury, sapsucker and branch pruning by squirrels. If you start seeing branches laying down on the ground uh, at the base of your trees, that may be one of the explanations. So I'm going to stop sharing here. And I can find the chat again. Are there any questions? And people can unmute themselves at this time, is that correct? Yes. Now you said the raising hand function people did not have on this meeting? Uh, no, that menu isn't on. Okay, so Minda says she enjoys the talk. If anyone who isn't shy wants to go ahead and unmute themselves, use mouse over the bottom of the screen and the mute unmute is on the, the lower left. Hi, this is April Corcoran. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, I have a question. Uh, when he talked about um, damage from cold weather and he talked about uh, actually weather burn versus um, this cold damage with the splitting of the bark down, you know, low by the root with uh, um, just on one side. Uh, what is the damage? How can you tell the damage that's just like the type of a uh, cold burn versus? All right, a, a winter burn mm -hmm. is something that you would see on on both conifers and on evergreen, um, broadleaf evergreen. So let's say boxwoods, for example, and they would the leaves just tend to turn lighter colored and dry out often on one side of the plant. And it would happen in those colder months. The cold damage that you'll see later in the year, the results of that cold damage on the stems will also be a decline or uh, you know, leaves wilting, branches dying and so forth. 
And then that's when you go, or at any time you can go and look to see if that bark splitting is happening down lower on those branches. Oh, thank you so much. And I just wanted to ask one more question. Can you actually prune that damage out and, and that uh, plant recover? Yes, you can, unless it's on the, at the very base, like you saw in that photograph. But yeah. also keep in mind that that picture was from my yard. That camellia didn't, that, that was the least of its problems. It also had root knot nematode and so had to be removed. So okay. yeah, if you can, if it's not low on the plant, you can actually prune those out um, and then just monitor. Okay, thank you so much. All right. Uh, First time using Zoom, working much better than when I watched presentation from NCC2. Okay, good. Turner Bond says you need to update the clinic list of the plant pests and pathogens. It isn't complete, you need to update it. All right, if he could get in touch with us, I'm not sure I know what list he's talking about, but yeah, feel free to send us an email and, and we'll look into that. Okay. All right, any other questions? It looks like Susan and Sarah may have unmuted themselves if they have questions. Yeah, I think that might be a wrap. What do you think, Mike? Sounds good. We asked you to block off until 1130, but we may be ending early and we have done so today, so. Yeah, and uh, thanks everyone for joining. Um, next time we won't obviously, hopefully not have to go over introduction to Zoom. Um, obviously, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us specifically about it, the experience. Um, but next time, yeah, we can get started right away talking about the program. And uh, again, we're we're dividing this up now so that you're not having to sit for two hours straight. And uh, we're going to hope to do about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes of uh, our webinar. And then the uh, special guest speaker will be speaking next month in the same, uh, through the same platform. And we'll just be presenting a couple of BOLO uh, things for next month. So that will be March 26th. Our featured speaker is Ryan Adams talking about developing an integrated pest management plan for your lawn and landscape. Awesome. Uh, I'll stop the recording now. Great. Thanks, Janine.